You know, the older I get, the more life experience that kind of comes my way, and I think this is probably true for everybody, that uh, you appreciate things more uh, later than you did when you were younger. Uh, I guess it was last Sunday I talked to you guys about it. I had the opportunity to go to Maryland uh, to officiate in a wedding that was there. And while we were there, uh, the day after the wedding, we scheduled a little bit of extra time on that Saturday to go to the National Mall where the Lincoln Memorial is. Um, and it, it's a sobering thing. I mean, you know, I know what the Vietnam Memorial Wall is, and I know what the Korean War Memorial is. And, uh, but when you go there, you see everybody's names etched in stone that died. Um, and then what was really hard is... Uh, I assumed, I didn't stop and ask, but people were taking their pictures by the name. And I was thinking, man, that's just got to be rough uh, to be a parent, a mom or dad or brother or sister to find your child's name, your son or daughter's name on that wall, and to take a picture there. So anyway, guys, we have a great country. Pray for it. Um, do your part in, in serving the country, the churches, um, and the communities. Uh, because a lot of people are giving their lives for what we enjoy and unfortunately what we take for granted, but we don't have to. We can learn. And if you get a chance, I encourage you to go to Washington, D.C., see those things, experience them uh, firsthand because pictures do not do them justice. Uh, so let's take a minute just to pray for our country uh, before we jump into Nehemiah. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for uh, today. And uh, the time that we set apart as a nation to remember those that gave their life uh, for sons and daughters and husbands and wives and brothers and sisters. Uh, we're just grateful, uh, grateful for what we get to enjoy because of their work, uh, their willingness uh, to fight for our freedom because it wouldn't be here if, if it wasn't for that. Uh, and God, we do just remember you um, and your death on the cross and the greater freedom that we have and we experience as believers in Christ who have been set free from sin and death and just the fact that death has no more hold on us uh, because of what your son has, has done. And uh, we rejoice in that, God, that uh, life is so much sweeter um, and fulfilling and purposeful because of you. And uh, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, take your Bible, open it up over the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. We're starting in verse 4. Uh, we started the series last week just about rebuilding. And so I want to I walk you through something that's, that's kind of a little fun, um, but I promise you it ties into what we're talking about in Nehemiah. When I start down this road, you're going to think, I don't know what he's talking about, but we will, we will get there, okay, I promise. So people research everything. I don't, I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. But they research people's buying patterns and tendencies uh, just across the board. It's like, you know, what do you want? How do you want it? When do you want it? And they market all that uh, for us. Uh, they look at voting patterns and gender and age and demographics. And I promise you, you have never seen a Texas edition Chevy truck in New Jersey. It doesn't, it doesn't work. They don't sell any of those there. They only sell them here because they research all the stuff that we want. They, and because here's what it does. As you go through all this research about what people buy and when they buy it and how they like it and all this, it tells you something about that person. Like you get to, you get to know them. And so that's what marketers do. They, they poll and they do all their research to try and tell them something about you because they want to sell their stuff to you. And so there, there was a, a, some research I went and did about what your car says about you, and, and they, they polled 200,000 Americans. Now listen, there's an exception to every rule, so if you're the exception, you're welcome to raise your hand and say, this is not true about me. It's fine if you need to do that. But, but they know a little bit about what they're talking about, so we're going to look at what your car has to say about you. So I, I could not memorize all of this, so here we go. Uh, if you drive a Ford, okay, you work in construction, probably you own a dog, uh, you like football, beef jerky, and pumpkin pie. When Toby Keith or Van Halen come on the radio, you turn them up. Um, and you're, you're, you're into getting your hands dirty, gardening, fishing, something like that. If you see that, that movie, the show that's on television about dirty jobs, and I don't know who it is, that, but it's always Ford 
that, and the truck is always muddy in, on those commercials, always and forever. So if you drive a Ford, those things are probably true about you. If you're, if you're a GM or a Chevy guy or girl, you like steak and eggs. Um, you probably think of yourself as mechanically inclined, whether you are or not. Um, <laughs> in fact, your garage is your happy place. You love dogs, football, and NASCAR. Uh, you blast Stevie Ray Vaughan and Kid Rock, and you don't mind losing your hair. <laughs> you know, it's just, I don't know how, it's like, do you ask that question, or they just offer up that information? I don't know. But um, you would never, ever, ever consider plastic surgery, and you prefer to buy American, okay? So if you're a Toyota kind of girl or guy, uh, you're probably a Gen Xer, you like Indian food, uh, guacamole, college football, soccer, you shop at Banana Republic, and the Apple Store. Uh, you like the movie Wall Street and Kevin Hart. You think he's funny. All right. Um, if you're a Chrysler kind of person, uh, compared to other drivers, you think that you're really super dependable. You're probably older than 65 if you're not. <laughs> you're getting there. College football dominates your fall Saturdays. Um, you'd probably admit that you go too long between haircuts. Now, okay, if you drive a Dodge, here's the Dodge, folks. Um, you think of yourself as big-hearted. Uh, you prefer to wash your own car. Uh, you don't style your hair. I, again, I don't know what the hair thing is, but you don't style your hair. You don't look after your health as much as you should. You like bacon, fried fish, NASCAR, and dogs again. Um, when you shop for clothes, you opt for comfort over style. That means Walmart or Academy or your go-to stores. Um, if you splurge, it's Target or Marshalls. <laughs> you don't know what the Banana Republic is. You're asking your neighbor. Um, <laughs> Okay, if you drive a Mercedes-Benz, you put a big emphasis on staying fit and active. You're either a Gen Xer or a baby boomer. You like to golf and play the stock market games. Uh, you buy your groceries at Whole Foods, or if you live in Huntsville, it's the premium section in Kroger. Um, <laughs> you would never drive an ugly car. That's just, you know, taboo. You would never, never do that. And you gravitate toward premium products and services. That means that the Geek Squad van shows up at your door to fix your computer. Um, if you drive a Lexus compared to other drivers, you think of yourself as sensible. And again, you are older, 65, because you're the only ones that can afford it. Um, <laughs> you, you cannot live without GPS in your car. You're a big fan of Starbucks and Costco. Okay? So, so here's the thing. They, they know these things about us. Whether it's all true of you or not, we see that there is some truth in this. And so they can tell you something about who you are by the car that you drive. So where we are in the story of Nehemiah is, is that Nehemiah has been, he's the cupbearer to the king. He's there in Susa. Um, he is in the citadel there. Hanani, his brother or fellow Israel, whatever that is, he comes to him and Nehemiah wants to know what's going on with Jerusalem. Tell me how things are. Zerubbabel had gone. He had rebuilt the temple. Ezra had gone there. He had done some stuff on the temple and then rebuilding or kind of bringing the law of Judaism back into Jerusalem. So Nehemiah wants to know how are things going. Tell me how things are. And he says, listen, it's bad. The people are disgraced. They're in shame. The walls are broken down. The gates have been burned by fire. I mean, it is, it is a hot mess in Jerusalem right now. Nothing is going well for the people. And so so that, that's how things are. In Nehemiah, the way that he responds to this is to pray. It says that he mourns and he fasts and he prays for many days. And so what he does, we have for us really is the prayer that Nehemiah wrote down and, and just recorded for us. So we have a record of what it is that he went to God and he prayed about. And as you read through his prayer, what you find is you discover something about the man Nehemiah. So just like your car says something about you, you can look at a person's prayer. You can even think about your own prayers. And it will tell you something about what's going on in you. It, it'll tell you what you believe to be true about God. It'll tell you what your hopes are, what your dreams are, what your concerns are, what your cares are, what you want to see changed, and what you'd like to stay the same. I mean, when you think about how you pray, it will tell so many things about you. And so let's read. I want to read to you the prayer that Nehemiah prayed. This is in verses 4 through 11 in chapter 1. He says, when I heard this, at Jerusalem, the walls are down, the gates are burned with fire. He says, when I heard this, I sat down and I wept. In fact, I mourned for days. I fasted and I prayed to the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. 
Look down and see me praying day and night for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, the decrees, the regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. And please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, that I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and you obey my commands and you live by them, then even if you were exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. And the people uh, you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Oh, Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. And in those days, I was the king's cupbearer. And so if you listen to Nehemiah's prayer, what you will hear are a lot of truths about him, about what he believed about God. He believed that God was a great and he was an awesome God. He believed that if he prayed and if the people returned and God heard and he remembered his promise that God would step in and he would undo all these bad things that he had done. He believed these things to be true about God. And as you listen to his prayer, you learn a little bit about what he believed about the character and about the nature of God. And as you listen to his prayer, another thing that you see is his concern for people. He's like, God, I want you to remember your people. I mean, these are the people that you made all these promises to. These are the people that you made covenants with. These are the people that you said, these are going to be my people. This is going to be my place. This is going to be my temple in which my glory is going to reside. And so if you listen to his prayer, what you find is, is that he had a great concern for the people of which he was praying for. And that's not always easy for us. If you look back to what it says about Nehemiah, that he was the king's cup bearer. Now, before I, I was researching the one for the next week. But a cupbearer, I, I thought he was like the slave of the household, you know, the one that the king kicked whenever he got angry. But that's not what a cupbearer did in a king's palace. He was a trusted advisor. Matter of fact, he was probably the most trusted person in all of the king's court. They were well paid because he handed the man his wine that could take his life at any moment. So he had to guard against poison. Sometimes he had to drink it before the king did. So you want somebody that you trust. You want somebody that you pay well. You want somebody that you can talk to and that you have confidence in to be your cupbearer. So he had everything in the world going for him, and yet his heart broke when he heard about what was happening to the people, his brothers in Jerusalem. And so he had a genuine concern for them. And then also what we find out about him and about his prayer and what was happening in his own life is, is that he was convicted of about his own sin. He was like, God, I know they sin. But so have I. And it's not just me, but my whole family's involved in this thing too. And I recognize the damage that theirs and mine and my family's sin has done to your plan and your purpose for this people. And I confess it to you. And he was willing to own up to the mistakes and the problems that they had created. And he trusted God. He, tr he was like, God, listen, I know that you're able to fix this. I know that if we return to you, I know that if we pray to you, I know that if we're right before you and we obey the commands and the regulations and the statutes, that you, you are able to get it all back together again. And so he trusted God to be good and to do the right thing. And so as you read through that, you begin to learn a little bit about Nehemiah and who he was, what he believed, what he thought about God, what his hopes and dreams and aspirations were. And here's the thing for you is, is that as you think back through your prayer, what you pray for on a daily basis, if you pray on a daily basis, well, I mean, who's on your mind, who's in your prayers, who's made the list that's actually, you know, in your Bible or in a journal, I mean, Who's there for you? Who do you remember on a daily basis or kind of like every now and then you might remember them? It just says a lot about, about who you are. So what I want to do is I want to walk through this framework of Nehemiah and kind of take you through it so that you can see what should be true of you. So the first one is this, is that if you pray, it, it, I mean, I don't want to even assume that that's true. Even in church, if you pray, it says a lot about what you believe about God. That you believe that he exists if you pray. Because, listen, here's the thing. We don't need to kid ourselves. Not everybody that shows up at church prays every day. 
Not, not everybody that's in, in worship is, is getting up, you know, 30 minutes before they go to work or they have to get in the car to go do whatever it is they're going to do. And, and having a quiet time, it may have been a week since the last time you prayed. It may, have been, it may have been six months. You might not literally remember the last time you sat down, except for maybe meal and God bless his food, you know, the nourishment of our body. You might not remember the last time that you prayed. So I don't want to just gloss over that. I, I, we want to hammer that one a little bit and just say you, you, this needs to be consistent for you in your life. So if you look in verse 5, he's praying, Oh, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commandments. The, the problem that the Jews had throughout history, and it is no different with the church because we all fall into the same problems, is they forgot God. You read through the Old Testament, it's constant. You forgot him, you're forgetting him, you're going to forget him if you keep doing this. They've got the Baal, they've got the ashram, they've got all these idols that they're bowing down and worshiping. I mean, they, they forget God. And when they forget God, this is what it means. That they are no longer seeking him. They're, they're no longer searching after God. And again, what that boils down to is, is they're not praying. There's no altar, there's no sacrifice, there's no prayer, there's, no, there's nothing going on. And so we should not kid ourselves by thinking that, you know what, I can go through my whole week or my whole month or the last six months of my life and not pray and still be okay with God. There is something just direly wrong with your faith if you are not praying. It's, it's as if we've moved on from God. I mean, that's the language that we use when we talk about dating. I mean, you're dating a guy, you're seeing a girl, things don't work out, you're just not really, the connection's not there, and so you say, I'm, I'm moving on, or I have moved on. Well, what it means is that you tried out a relationship, you enjoy the relationship for a while, and then you've left that relationship to something else that's out there, and that's what we do with God, isn't it? I mean, we, 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 we try church out, you know, we try the whole you know, I'm going to have a quiet time, a devotional time with God. We spend a little bit of time, maybe a week or a couple of days with him. And then something, I mean, we, we go to work and, you know, people get sick and things happen and we got problems in our life or we just get busy with things happening. And, and, and so we just, we kind of move on in, in with what's happening and we move on from God. And that, that wasn't healthy for them. I promise you it wasn't. And, it, and it's not healthy for us. And so if you pray, here, here's what I want you to know. If you pray, it is a statement of your faith. It's a statement of faith. It doesn't even matter where you are with God. Just the fact that you're praying is a statement of faith because it's stating that you believe that God listens. Because why would any of us pray to a God who is unseen that we don't believe listens? So if you're praying, on a daily basis, even a weekly basis. I mean, at least it's a statement of your faith that you believe that God listens. It's also a statement of your faith that you believe that God cares. Because again, I mean, why would you speak and pray to a God who is not seen, who doesn't listen and doesn't care about you? So we, we understand that God loves us and we understand that God intervenes on our behalf and we know that God cares for us or we wouldn't bother praying, right? So just praying is a statement of faith that he listens and that he cares. It's also just a statement of us that we know that God can act, that he is powerful enough to intervene with whatever is going on in our lives. Because he is God and because he is sovereign and because he is, is good, we, we know that when we pray that he's listening and he cares and he's powerful enough to do something about what it is that we are, are praying about. You know, Jesus, I mean, he makes some comments that are just, they're almost mind-blowing for us to even consider. He's like, say to this mountain, go and be thrown into the sea and whatever you believe is going to be done for you. And we're like, Lord, I, I mean, how? How does those things work? Well, it doesn't work in our power. It, it doesn't work in, in, in the things, in our strength, what we're able to accomplish. That, that's a God type of thing. Only, only God does that. And when we pray, we're, we're saying, man, I know he's listening. I know he cares. I know that he's able. I know that God is able. And, and we're saying, too, that God, we believe that he's good. Because we know that, that God is going to move on our behalf you know, in the book of James chapter 2, it says, For as the body, the body, apart from the spirit is dead. It means if we don't have a spirit inside of us, we, we have a body, but we're not here anymore. I mean, we're dead. He said, So also faith apart from works is dead. 
Now, when we talk about works, we're thinking about, you know, knocking on your neighbor's door and do you know Jesus? And, and, and that's part of it. Or, or coming to church and, and serving as a greeter or teaching a Bible study or, you know, leading a life group or, you know, some, that, that's what we think. But, but prayer is a work too, isn't it? I mean, it's something that we do that's a tangible thing that we do that's part of our faith. And so if you're not praying on a consistent daily basis, if it's been a week or a month or six months since you can remember that you've even prayed, then, then what does that say about your faith? I mean, what it says about your faith is, is that it's, it's dying. It's not where it needs to be. It's not on, on fire. There's not the life that should be there right now. And so if you haven't been, I encourage you to start, to start praying. Don't move on from God to something else. Don't stay away from him, but to seek him and to search for him. So that, I mean, prayer is what it should say about you, that you believe that God exists. Second thing is this, is, is that people should be at the heart of your conversations with God. Anytime you're, you're sitting there with the Lord and you're, you're talking to him, um, your mom, your dad, your wife, your husband, your kids, your grandkids, I mean, th those, those are the people, those are the things that should be at the heart of your conversations with God. If you listen to what Nehemiah said back in verse 6, he's like, God, listen to my prayer. Now, I don't, I don't think he's demanding. I, I think he's saying, God, I really need you to hear what I'm saying right now. There, there's a sense of urgency in his voice that I need you to hear because things are not good. He says, look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. And so, you know, do you, do you see people? I mean, we, we see a lot of people. We see the form and we see the figure and we see these guys, girls, child, and adult. I mean, we, we, we understand all those things. But do we see people? Do, do we see their hurts? Do we see their struggles? Do we see their hopes, their aspirations, their ambitions, the things that are on their mind? Do, do we see those things? And, and, and here, just kind of my observation too, that it, it seems sometimes that it's hardest to see those people that you are closest to. You know, if you're driving down the road and some guy's got a sign and, you know, we'll work for food or you know, just obviously in dire situations, our heart just, just goes out. To, to them because it's new, it's fresh, we've not seen them before. I think it's easier to see people that we're not familiar with. But the people that you live with, like your wife or your husband or, or even your children, we, we become so familiar with the routines that we're, the, what we have and, and the things that people are doing on just kind of a constant basis all day long that, that we, we, we don't see our husbands. We don't see their needs. We don't see their fears. We don't see what's going on in life. And we, don't, we don't see our wives. We don't see kind of the things that they're, they're struggling with. And so do, do you see them? Because when you see them, when you see people, that's when you have a real desire to begin to pray for them. Because your heart gets connected with what's happening in their life. And when you think through just you know, the whole character and the nature of God, I hope you know that God prays for you. You know, the Holy Spirit prays for us. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 27. It says, And he who searches the hearts, that's, that's the Spirit of God, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the th saints according to the will of God. And so we have the Spirit of God that, that literally is interceding for us on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it talks about how Jesus prays for us. It says, therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. I hope you know the difference, it, slight difference, maybe nuance, semantics here with word choice. But we, we pray for people, but then, but then we intercede for people. And, and intercession is just, man, there's, there are hearts going out. I mean, they're on our minds. It's just kind of a constant thing. And, and everybody can't be on our mind all the time. But there are moments in our lives where we are, we are interceding for people. Now, we physically can't do that. I can't have everybody on my mind all at the same time. And you can't do that either. But listen, the Spirit can. And so can Jesus. He can have you on his mind at all moments of the day and be in intercession for you. And so if God does that for us, if that's the heart of God, then shouldn't it be the heart of you and I as his people who have the Spirit of God living inside of us and Jesus in us that we at least are moved to pray for others? 
So I hope you pray for your husband. Every You are married to that man. It is important that God works in his life. So pray for him every single day. Pray that he would be a great leader. Pray that he would love the Lord. Pray that God would move in his life. If you are a guy and you're married to this woman, look, it is important that you pray for her. She is a part of your flesh. And so you need to be interceding for her. You've got kids. You've got grandkids. You need to be praying for them. People that you work with, people that you know and that you've been around and you have seen what's happening in their life. Be in prayer for them. That, that's what our prayers should say about us, that the bulk of it is about people. Because God's heart is for this world and for our salvation and for our sanctification, that we are made like Jesus more and more every single day. And so we, we need to be like him, and we need, we need to pray. Number three is this. We ought to be aware in our prayers. We ought to be aware of our own issues. I mean, the problems, the sin, the faults, the attitudes, the thoughts, the words that come out of our mouth, we we should be aware of what's happening in our own heart. It says in verse 7, it says, We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, the decrees, the regulations that you have given us through your, your servant Moses. And so Nehemiah understood. He's like, we've messed up. And the reason we're in the position that we're in right now is because of the decisions that we have made, because we've sinned and we've moved on from you, God. We're not searching. We're not seeking. We're not praying to you anymore. And so, Lord, we, we need to straighten things out. And what he's doing is he's confessing. And confession is not always an easy thing for us because we, we sometimes we're not interested in changing. I, I see this in church life more than anything else. We feel like we're pretty good, so we don't need to do anything else. Like, you know, we're happy with 80%. Like, B, I'm, I don't want, there's no reason to shoot for an A and do the extra work. You know, 80 is good for me. And so we're good with a bulk change, but the, we like to hold on to the one or two things. You know, maybe it's the anger, maybe it's the words that we choose when we get stressed out. You know, maybe it's some vice or some pet habit that you've got that you know God has called you away from. What, whatever that is, I just see it in Christians' lives all the time. We're like, hey, I'm pretty good, and we compare ourselves to the world. We're like, man, compared to them, I'm really good, and so God should be good enough with me being good enough. But we, we don't, we're really not interested in change. And there's usually one or two things just kind of hanging around out there that maybe not every day, but we're, we kind of go back to on, on, a, on a consistent basis. And so we got to confess those things to God. Second reason why I think we struggle with confession is because we're really not interested in being wrong. We're really not interested in being wrong. And I, just my own life, it may not be this way for you. It's easy for me, I think, most of the time, to just say to God, listen, I'm wrong, okay? I confess my sin because he's not here. I don't always hear immediately back from him. There's usually not a verbal rebuke or criticism of me. So, you know, it's, it's easier to confess my sin to God than it is my wife, okay? Because she's there, and there's usually a response to that confession. It's not fun to say something to your kids that you shouldn't have said, and you have to come back and say, you know, like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. You know, because then they're disappointed in you as a parent. And so it's, it's really, it's hard for us to admit that, that we were wrong. What, what's even more difficult, and I think this is true for, for everybody, is not just admitting that you were wrong, but admitting that somebody else was right. I don't know how it works in your family, but, you know, honey, man, I was wrong, and you were right. Now, you know, that's just hard to do. I don't know about you. Now, if I can admit I'm wrong without admitting her that she's right, then that's okay. I mean, I can do that pretty easily. But having to say, honey, I'm wrong and, and you were right, that, that's just that's twice as hard to be able to do those things. So I, I think we struggle with this whole confession. We stop a little short of, of you know, the distance that, that we should go. And then here's the last one, I think, why we, we struggle with confession, is that we're repeat offenders. That, that we do it and we confess, and we do it and we confess, and we do it and we confess, and we do it and we confess. And then along down the line, we get, it gets a little awkward, right? You know, that, that you go back to God and you're like, God, I'm sorry again. You know, and we start telling ourselves God's tired of listening to this. Well, he may be, but, he, but you, you've got to continue to, 
to speak the words. You've got to continue to have the conversation. Like any married couple, my wife and I, there, there's a few conversations that we have on a repeated basis for the last 27 years. You know, we, we get a little frustrated about that. We, we're like, how can we not fix this? I mean, we're adults, okay? We, we, we love Jesus. We love each other. We try to do what's right, but we haven't quite fixed this one yet. And so we have this conversation that kind of repeats itself over and over and over again. But, but here's the thing. That, that you cannot move past it until you move through it. So if, you are, if you're a repeat offender of things, you, you've, got to just, you've got to continue to have the conversation. If it's a marriage thing, it doesn't matter. If you've talked about it 50 times, you have the 51st conversation. You continue to have it. Because as soon as you don't have it any longer, you're stuck. So you've got to continue. Same thing with God. You've sinned, you've known you've sinned, you're a repeat offender, it's getting a little awkward, a little embarrassing now. You go back to God, you have the conversation again. Because the only way to move past it is to move through it. And confession is what allows you to move past these things and through it. That, that's what you've got to do. Now, here's why confession is important. Because it restores relationships. It, I don't know what else does. I, I, we, you, when, when there's sin between two people or there's sin between you and your God, I, I don't know what else makes it right. I don't know what else gets you past it and through it. You've got to confess, and you've got to do it repeatedly, and it's got to happen over the 27 years and over the 50 years and the 75 years of your life. It, it, you just have to do it because that's the only thing that restores relationships. In a marriage, it's the only thing that works. You keep having the conversation. It, with kids, you keep having it. With God and your relationship with him, you keep having the conversation. You, as soon as you're done with the conversation, then the relationship can't grow until you get past that, that point. So your prayer should have confession. It should be part of you and who you see yourself as and understand yourself as that, that you know that you're a sinner. I mean, we all struggle with those things in, in life. Number four is this, that your talks with God. Now, I want you to remember, Nehemiah heard that the gates were burned that the walls were torn down, that the people were in disgrace and shame. It, he's mourning. He's fasting. It, it probably could get worse, but it was, it was pretty bad, okay? But listen to how he prays. It's still positive, and it's still hopeful because of his trust in Christ. It says, please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place that I have chosen for my name to be honored. So Nehemiah knew, he knew, and, and we do too, that in the most just dire circumstances, remember this, God is still good. And God listens, and God cares, and God is able, and God wants to work all things out for our good. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, if you haven't yet memorized this, you, you need to do this. Because in any and every circumstance that, that's difficult and hard, we need to remember what it says. That we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We know that God can take every situation. Everything that happens in the dynamic of a home and in a church and in life... And for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose, he can take all those things, as hard as they may be, and he can work them out for our good. That is, that is the only way to stay positive and to stay hopeful in some of the circumstances that we face in life. And so just like cars can tell us something about us, so our prayers tell us something about us as well. So, so maybe, maybe this is helpful for you to take the framework that you've got there on the back of your bulletin and the notes. Take that framework and begin to use it in your prayers. So number one, stay consistent in your prayer. Do it every single day because it's a statement of your faith that you believe that God listens and he cares and he loves you and he's able and he's good and he's going to work it out for your good. So keep consistent in your prayer and pray, pray, pray for the people who are in your life. Your family, your friends, the people that you work with. But keep them at the heart of your conversation with God. Own up to your mistakes. Even if you're a repeat offender, continue to struggle against the sin in your life. And sometimes it is a struggle. But you keep doing that. And then the last thing, you just remember 
remind yourself of, of how good God is and his promises and keep it hopeful, keep it positive because there is, there's hope. There's hope with God who loves us and the God who cares about us. So let me pray for us.